welcome you all to our webinar series, which we are doing along with G20. Uh, thanks to Professor Sachin Chaturvedi who got us into this. And uh, this is part of the task force. And this is task force five on which we are planning to do eight more lecture series, the webinar series. Today is the second and then eight more after today. Today, as you know, we have Dr. Arvind Virmani, who is going to be chairing the session. And we have three speakers, Dr. Surjit Bhalla, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, and Dr. Franny. I'll briefly introduce the three speakers, as well as the chair of the session, before handing over the mic to the chair. As we all know in our country, Dr. Arvind Virmani is member of Niti Ayo. He was earlier the chairman of the Foundation for Economic Growth and Welfare and president of the Forum for Strategic Initiatives. He has been a mentor to FICI and a member of RBA Technical Advisory Committee on Monetary Policy. He was earlier executive director at the International Monetary Fund and before that chief economic advisor, Ministry of Finance, and Principal Advisor Planning Commission. During his tenure, he has advised on a host of atomic policy reforms, especially the ones in 1991. And he has 100 policy, policy papers, notes, and he has participated in various committees of the government. He has served as a member of Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and as Director and Chief Executive of the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. He has published in referee journals, 35 journal articles, and 20 book chapters, and written over 50 other working papers in areas of macroeconomics, growth, finance, tax reform, international trade, and tariffs, international relations, and national security strategy. Our first speaker for the day is Dr. Surjit Bhalla, he is the former executive director of the International Monetary Fund, representing India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Bhutan. He was also, prior to that, member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. In addition, he has served as chairperson for the Ministry of Commerce High Level Advisory Group on Trade, economic advisor to the 15th Finance Commission, Government of India. He is a regular invitee to the Aspen Institute program on World Economy USA 2000 till present, and he was also a contributing editor for India. Our next speaker is Professor Sachin Chaturvedi. Professor Sachin Chaturvedi is currently Director General of the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, a New Delhi-based think tank. He works on issues related to development economics, involving development finance, SDGs, and South-South cooperation, apart from trade, investment, and innovation linkages, with special focus on WTO. Currently, he is also Vice Chairman at the Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Good Governance, and policy analysis and ex officio vice chairman of Madhya Pradesh State Policy and Planning Commission. He is also member, Board of Governors, Reserve Bank of India. Professor Sachin has been part of several important initiatives of the government of India and takes keen interest in transforming economic policy making towards integrated and evidence based approaches. He is one of the foremost commentators on India's external sector, economic engagements, and partnerships. He is considered as most dynamic and affable by his peers and has mentored several bright scholars and researchers in the profession. He has authored, edited more than 22 books, apart from contributing several chapters in the edited volumes and also publishing several research articles in prestigious journals. He is on the editorial board of several journals, including the South Asian Economic Journal, IDS Bulletin, Sussex, UK, among others. His book, and this is very important, The Logic of Sharing Indian Approach to South-South Cooperation, 
has been acclaimed internationally as one of the best volumes on international development cooperation. Professor Sachin was also the Global Justice Fellow at the Macmillan Center for International Affairs at Yale University and has served as a visiting professor at GU and was a developing country fellow at the University of Amsterdam, visiting fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies Shimla and visiting scholar at the German Development Institute in 2007. Our last speaker for the day is Dr. Fanny Lesher. Dr. Fanny is a finance and development expert with long-standing global experience leading and transforming organizations in the private, public, and not for private spheres. Prior to joining TDB, she served as Senior Vice President of the African Development Bank, Vice President at the World Bank Group, and Executive Secretary of the African Capacity Building Foundation. In addition to having founded two companies and being the CEO of Southbridge Investments, Dr. Fanny is a board member, trustee, special advisor, founder, and member of a number of prestigious international organizations, including the World Economic Forum, MIT, OCP Group African Risk Capacity, African Economic Research Consortium, Institute for Security Studies, King Bordeaux Foundation USA, Nelson Mandela Institute for Science and Technology, amongst others. She is a well-recognized author and academic, having published several, several books, articles, and papers in international development, and having taught master's level courses at Sciences Po, MIT, Harvard, Duke, and the University of Tokyo. In addition to her civil engineering degree from Dar es Salaam University and a transportation master's from MIT, Dr. Frenny holds a PhD in infrastructure systems from MIT and honorary degrees from North Central College and Lancaster University. With this, I hand over the session to Dr. Arvind Virmani to take the proceedings further. Dr. Virmani, please. Thank you, Taran. Um, let me very briefly kind of uh, give a, a, a broad uh, perspective of the issues. Of course, our topic today is role and advocacy of uh, multilateral development banks, MDBs or MDIs as they are often called. And I'm sure we'll get into uh, various levels of detail, but just a very quick overview. I mean, it, it kind of takes me back to my first research project in the uh, in World Bank, uh, which was on credit markets in developing countries. And so uh, basically, uh, what I tried to do was to define the role of development banks in in the internal development. And, and to uh, what I did was I built a model of asymmetric information and model hazard, and then uh, said uh, that if there are information problems and knowledge, what is the optimal policy? And one of the things uh, I came up with was uh, that you, you shouldn't uh, subsidized interest rates, but you should, uh, in effect, share risk or what I call collateral subsidy. Anyway, uh, my point in giving this little uh, story is that there is a higher level of uh, analysis of uh, you know what the MDBs are supposed to do, wh where are the gaps they're trying to fill. But I think most likely we will uh, take that as kind of given here, uh, most people and go into four issues uh, which come up again and again. One uh, is the issue of voting rights. You know, who controls the overall policy uh, and approach uh, under which these uh, MDBs function. And the second is kind of borrowing rights, often uh, in World Bank and IMF called quotas, which determine how much a country can borrow, how easily. And the third is uh, how uh, the senior most management, the senior management of these banks is selected. You know, the head of the uh, institution, MD or whatever they are called, uh, and uh, the number, uh, the, the second level group of managers. And of course, then finally, the uh, information, the knowledge base of the professionals, uh, where we will also, I'm sure, hear uh, quite a lot, which is that 
uh, if they come from developed countries, they may not have uh, much knowledge and information and experience uh, of uh, the middle income or the poorer countries uh, who are involved. So, so basically, uh, this is the broad picture. I'm sure our uh, three speakers will go into the various aspects which they have been concerned with. And so with that, let me uh, start uh, with uh, Dr. Surjit Bhalla, who was recently an executive director at the IMF. Thank you, Arvind, um, and thank you, Igor, for uh, inviting me to this. Um, it is indeed a very topical topic um, because of the various issues uh, that have come up now, and including in it the whole analysis or the discussion of quotas. Okay. The first point that I would like to make is that now more so than ever before, of course, the world is continuously changing. Um, the role of the uh, MDBs is continuously changing or should be changing. But in my view, it hasn't changed that much. And there is a profound need for uh, the role to be re-examined. I will give two prominent examples of where the role has changed <clears throat> and where it uh, uh, needs to be adjusted. Let's take the what Arvind just mentioned on quotas. Now, that's the, I will talk mainly on the IMF, um, so in some sense, some of these things apply with equal force to the World Bank and other institutions. But let's take the IMF, which is the only uh, interna MDB where there is something called the quotas, which is the ownership um, and with, which determines how much you can borrow or not borrow uh, from the fund. Now, you know, there hasn't been a reform of uh, sort of new, new adjustments, new calculations to the quota system since 2010. That was the last time um, that uh, the IMF reformed. After that, any increase in capital is allocated according to the percentages um, that were assumed in 2010. Now, at the same time, uh, the IMF annually, uh, and especially this year, will hold a review. They are mandated to review the quota system every two years every five years, sorry, and it is due to be done this year. Let me give you just one example of the existing model of the IMF for allocation of quotas. According, so if you just update, according, they have five variables I don't want to go into, but there are some gross, uh, not miscalculations, but if you will, misadjustments. <clears throat> if you go according to the 2010 quota system established, the formula, not the system, the formula, then in the, if you just updated it according to the rate of growth of GDP in PPP, rate of growth of GDP in, in dollar terms, as well as an openness index and so on and so forth, you get that Singapore with something like 5 million population will now have a larger quota than Indonesia with something like plus 200 million. Now, obviously, population is not a criteria uh, in this, and I think it should be made uh, a criteria, though per capita income is based, but you're getting some really absurd um, conclusions, if you continue to do with the model as existed in 2010, which is when Arvind uh, was there. Uh, though I think it was established in 2014. So this reform is badly needed. Now come to the second aspect of the major reform that's needed, and you read about it daily in the newspapers, 
and that is the role of China and its credit. It's called debt. It's debt of the other countries, Chinese debt. Now, it turns out that Chinese debt today and accumulated loans uh, of China are higher than those of the World Bank. That's fact number one. Second, that about 50% of Chinese loans are not transparent. We do not know uh, where they originated, who they went to, but obviously uh, researchers like Catherine Reinhardt, uh, who was until very recently the chief economist at the World Bank, uh, her paper is the one which was published last year um, that comes up with this estimate that about 50% of Chinese debt is not transparent, is not in the record books. Third, as you both in the case of Sri Lanka and in the case of Pakistan um, and in the case of uh, especially these two, you have that until China comes to the table and agrees to the terms, the loans cannot be granted, which is why Sri Lanka, despite having a crisis, a major crisis, 14, 16 months ago, uh, still hasn't got the IMF loan. They're likely to get it uh, very soon because China has agreed um, to, uh, I guess, that's also not transparent as to how much the haircut should be, and the haircut should be equal to all the creditors. But if you don't know how much um, credit uh, that China has given, you can't institute or you can't ask for a haircut. So I think the last point on this is that as you know, several of us who have been there and maybe others will also attest that basically the IMF and I think the World Bank is not a multilateral institution, it is a G7 institution. Um, now, apart from by G7, I don't mean the fact that the, uh, the president of the World Bank is always appointed by America and the president of the World IMF is always appointed by the Europeans or the managing director. What I mean by that is there isn't a single policy that will be goes through uh, without um, the G7 agreeing to it. Um, and I think they dictate um, all the policies, certainly while I was there, um, that was the case. And one interesting example of how the G7 and how the IMF operates, and this will be my last point, um, is that COVID came and um, the IMF decided that they will loan out uh, tons of dollars. Uh, several hundred billion. And last year, while I was still there, they were talking about, oh, oh, we've got a new developing market debt crisis. So first, they give the loans to this, to the countries. Um, and then just a year later, you have to get additional loans in order to cover the debt that you've already incurred. Now, truly, you know, the uh, COVID was an exceptional, but the point is that uh, there are uh, ways by which the MDBs keep themselves in business. Um, the our World Bank, for example, keeps itself in business by constantly uh, overstating uh, the poverty uh, levels in countries. And the IMF keeps itself in business by not having adequate checks and balances or uh, on, on the loans that they give out. And then you have an additional China problem. So I hope uh, the experts around the table will address and how the international organizations and us can get out of this mess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sujit. Sachin Chaturvedi. Uh, so uh, let's go over to you, though I think we are still missing the 
third speaker, but yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vimani. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Jan Sinji, for getting me this opportunity. Uh, 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 Professor Balla has already laid out the broad contours of our discussion so well. And I think uh, Chair has uh, uh, mentioned the four points which are absolutely essential as we focus, discuss, and bring under our analysis uh, role of MDBs. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, issuing of voting rights or borrowing rights, the idea of uh, 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 the management uh, uh, that that is uh, there both at the senior level and at the uh, second or third tier, which, which are I think also ex extremely important. And then the question of uh, knowledge base, uh, which I think is uh, equally important of the uh, MDVs, largely in terms of uh, the role uh, that we are uh, looking at. And I think uh, given the fact that uh, uh, developing countries, and as Dr. Bala rightly said, uh, uh, the per capita uh, uh, should be the criteria in terms of how we go forward with MDBs. I think uh, uh, infrastructure financing is something where most of the developing countries, the least developed countries, require support of uh, of MDBs. And so, so raising resources for long-term financing uh, uh, and investment has been one of the major challenges uh, almost to all the southern economies have been facing and this is largely in terms of uh, how infrastructure support for long term financing uh, has to come in at national level uh, back in 99 2000 lot of discussion came up for uh, corporate bonds and things like that but the world bank and the adp scenario has been very different of late uh, more discussions are coming in as we are talking about uh, 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 the planetary and climate change uh, uh, commitment which are there, which are being uh, discussed from time to time, and also in terms of how uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the role that MDBs have uh, have to focus, and and that's where uh, we are trying to see how uh, both uh, uh, the World Bank, ADB in the Asian context, but also uh, the other MDBs, in what way they can uh, really uh, support uh, uh, the designs, the programs, the targeted groups uh, under the SDGs but also in terms of uh, uh, the uh, infrastructure financing. That, I think, is, is important uh, without losing out the AAA rating and also the capital structure of the banks. And, and this is something which is uh, important for, uh, uh, for all MDBs to handle and also to respond to the larger uh, challenges they all are facing. And this is where I think uh, uh, the role of MDBs uh, comes in both in terms of the G20 discussions which are on and also in terms of where the power is flowing out from. Uh, the uh, G20 constituted an independent group uh, which has uh, given its report and I think it's uh, uh, pertinent here to uh, bring out as to uh, the mix that is there of multilateral, bilateral and many other donors. They have uh, their strength in terms of the grant elements but MDBs uh, have been raising uh, uh, resources from the market and and they have, uh, based on the narrow capital base that they have uh, uh, from the members. So this, I think, is something which is uh, uh, not uh, getting expanded. And the countries that are uh, uh, holding the larger shares are not uh, uh, open in terms of how uh, others have to give in space if they are not going to go forward uh, with the uh, capitalization. And this is something that G20 in last three meetings have discussed at length more and more issues are coming in in terms of prioritizing the long term social and and climate related goals and also mobilizing private uh, uh, resources for uh, uh, for mdbs and this is where uh, the role of countries like china uh, uh, comes up uh, the G20 high-level debt roundtable that was there, it has uh, 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 sort of come up uh, in terms of some solutions. And as Dr. Balla rightly mentioned, uh, some countries would have to behave more responsibly uh, in terms of how they are going to take uh, 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 things forward, even uh, uh, in case of uh, ADB and others. Uh, the fourth point that uh, uh, Dr. Virmani mentioned in terms of knowledge base, I think that is absolutely essential. Uh, the institution that we have created, particularly the new development bank of the BRICS, the knowledge base, the uh, bandwidth, and also uh, the ability to bring in impact assessment and, and engagement with larger audience is, is a very pale uh, a picture that we get uh, uh, from the uh, larger context within which World Bank has been operating. 
so little innovation little connect with the ground and uh, 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 inadequate uh, intellectual response to uh, the requirements of the developing countries i think uh, is something where we need to uh, to work out some of the funds have uh, contributed immensely and that's where i feel uh, uh, the role of the mdbs would have to be uh, uh, a sort of revisited particularly uh, the small amount of shareholder capital and stronger financial track record uh, uh, that some of them have they have the ability uh, to get out in the market and 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 raise more resources and that's where i think uh, uh, two issues which are uh, uh, extremely uh, important here uh, one is the the uh, the uh, creditor treatment and also uh, uh, the callable capital uh, that they they can command and they can contribute to but this largely has to be dovetailed with the development priorities and low cost access to uh, to some of these funds the basel norms and and uh, and uh, other uh, uh, sort of uh, impediments which are uh, there not in just in terms of governance but also in terms of uh, raising the cost and this is where the fragmentation of the finance uh, that we are witnessing uh, in terms of uh, sdg aligned finance climate friendly finance uh, uh, the green finance uh, that has uh, uh, posed far more challenges uh, for uh, for the governance within which uh, mdb cap and the mdb uh, undertakings have to be uh, taken in the g20 uh, independent uh, review has recommended uh, uh, four five major issues which are related to creditor treatment and callable capital but they have also raised issues in terms of how uh, the preferred creditor treatment uh, is to be the pct is to be addressed and that i think is uh, uh, extremely important and dr virmani just the last point that i want to mention uh, is in terms of how uh, uh, the uh, uh, convergence is 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 uh, uh, appearing both in terms of uh, uh, the uh, ability of the countries to repay but requiring adequate uh, financial support in the beginning and the inability of the mdbs to respond uh, uh, to the larger uh, demands that are coming in and this is where i think uh, the regional politics is playing uh, an extremely uh, 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 sort of decoupling role and and here uh, i would very much like to mention uh, uh, the uh, other instruments that have come up particularly aiib and others where uh, more of our uh, uh, regional cooperation regional partnership and uh, uh, regional availability of resources uh, uh, was coming in and i think this is uh, largely also trying to contribute in terms of how we see mdbs playing that role of strengthening the portfolio uh, the point that uh, that i think is important here uh, is to see uh, what direction g20 is going to take uh, uh, this recapitalization uh, uh, framework forward and that i think is uh, is important for countries india's presidency uh, and just in the bangalore meeting the issue came up of uh, uh, recapitalization of uh, mdbs uh, trying to focus on uh, on safety uh, nets that are they um, uh, bringing in the tall risk uh, that comes in with the uh, uh, probability of an mdb uh, facing a ma uh, major financial uh, uh, collapse i think are are some of the issues which are important the african development bank or caribbean development bank have their own challenges they require funding and and this is where uh, i think uh, if i see the domestic context uh, uh, it is important uh, india would have to see how our share capital in these banks uh, are are going to be stepped up uh, there was lot of discussion some time back when uh, uh, the uh, the caribbean development bank uh, assigned certain projects to uh, uh, south korea and not to the indian firm that was uh, in the fray for uh, assignment and and uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, semi formal uh, uh, explanation that came out of various consultations was uh, uh, the huge share uh, Uh, as uh, south korea uh, uh, took up uh, uh, some time back uh, in the bank so i think uh, these linkages dr virmani are 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 important uh, uh, the rising profile of indian company 
increase the rising profile of our, uh, uh, our project executors, our ability to deliver development projects, and our ability to take, uh, uh, take up tasks across uh, uh, these countries if it is linked uh, with the share capital or uh, uh, traction in the bank, and then I think uh, it would be a major challenge. So we need uh, uh, um, uh, not only the uh, four points that uh, uh, Dr. Virmani mentioned, and I fully agree uh, with all of them. Uh, probably uh, somewhere knowledge base would also have to be seen uh, away uh, uh, from the uh, share capital of the countries and would have to be seen more from uh, 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 impartial perspective, if I can say, uh, say so. So with, with these words, uh, 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 Dr. Virmani, I would stop here and, uh, and would take up questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Charan Singh is uh, the uh, third speaker here, or should I just say a few things? So she's traveling. She's trying to connect. Okay. But she's okay. not able oh, to. Her secretary me... is in touch with her. Maybe right. in five, 10 minutes she connects. But right now, right. we are me... in touch with both of them and not successful. Okay, let me uh, just take up two issues which have been mentioned. Uh, one is uh, uh, this uh, question of uh, predator terms uh, and commitments and transparency in the loan uh, application. Uh, it's been mentioned in connection with one country and has come up. Uh, but, you know, I, I was in the finance ministry for a long time and I still remember the struggle we had. Uh, to get these things into first the multilateral development banks and then into the bilateral loans, particularly the bilateral. I think more or less by the time I uh, became very active there, the bilat the MDBs had become more transparent and more clear in their terms and conditions of lending. But the struggle I was personally involved in was the uh, bilateral, where they used to have uh, restrictions on where you could buy what exactly the terms were, et cetera. So this transparency, when, when I heard, uh, I, I don't want to overemphasize one country, some of you have mentioned it, but when I heard the uh, first came across uh, these lending, I mean, it was like people were ignoring this long struggle. I mean, I remember the struggle uh, of uh, trying to make the loans and what we did, uh, I think it was during the, uh, Vajpayee regime, that doesn't matter, but uh, what we did was we then decided to uh, stop uh, borrowing, uh, bilateral borrowing, except for the three or, or five largest borrowers, uh, because uh, their uh, terms of lending were too restrictive, etc. So that is one issue which clearly has come up with these new big borrowers. I mean, uh, like uh, Dr. Bhalla mentioned, uh, you know, uh, that uh, I, I didn't know this number. I, I hope this is correct, that uh, China's bilateral debt is more than World Bank. I, that, I'm surprised, but anyway, yeah. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter what the exact is, just tells you what the magnitude is, yeah. Uh, the second issue is of haircut. Uh, and again, this issue uh, we addressed in the global financial crisis. My argument was uh, that uh, for certain countries, for example, Greece, uh, that you know, uh, there were these large loans which were being given and they would never be able to repay them. Again, Dr. Bhalla has raised this because he's familiar with similar things happening in the IMF because I'm also from my memory of the IMF uh, was that, and, and the reason was exactly this, that uh, unless uh, there was a haircut taken by all borrowers, this lending would just go to repay the ones, the private sector, that, that's what I anticipated uh, in the loans to some of the countries like Greece and perhaps even Italy and other countries which couldn't fully repay these loans. So, so the issue of haircut, which is why it's now so important, that has to be decided beforehand. Because if one country says, no, I'm not going to take any haircut, then you give uh, Sri Lanka or Pakistan or whoever uh, a whole bunch of loans, they just go to repay that particular country. It doesn't help uh, the borrower. So this is a very critical issue which we address, which actually was missed. Uh, again, Dr. Bala is right that some of these things they they uh, you know were, were politically decided. Uh, I think the, Dr. Chaturvedi was also saying where the geopolitics comes in, uh, the the pure technical stuff is all ignored, you know. And, and in that case, it was to save the banks because banks had been major lenders to to Greece, 
and I'm not saying this in hindsight, I wrote separate papers and I argued this in the board and other places. In fact, I, I went, uh, one of the countries which actually worked was Ireland, uh, uh, where this problem they managed to sort out, but in other countries they had to redo the loans and have a haircut later. So, so this whole issue of haircuts is very important. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, uh, Dr. Charan Singh, uh, do you want to kind of add some things while we are waiting for the thing, or should we? So we have just received an email from Dr. Freddy. She is mm -hmm. traveling and she is having trouble downloading and getting connected. She says there's very low connectivity here. So she is okay. apologized. I'm sorry, we'll have to miss her today. She'll okay. not be able to join us. That's exactly what I gather from her email. Right. In the meantime, sir, uh, we have had two speakers, and uh, Dr. Bala has himself worked in the World Bank. You have worked in the World Bank, and uh, Professor Sachin has written and worked extensively on this area. One thing which has always perplexed me is that yes, these MDBs got created. Uh, of course, the main ones IMF and the World Bank 75 years ago, and um, they have they are centered there. And as last time it was mentioned, North Atlantic institutions. The point is, with the world having expanded, commerce having expanded, the economy is having expanded. The role of the emerging countries having expanded and, and the economic growth taking place at the pace at which it is growing. These MDBs not only serve as credit institutions, they also love, serve as learning institutions and yeah. advisory bodies. Yeah. Now, my feeling is, that over these years, 75 odd years that the world has evolved, the focus of research, advisory, and of course, credit as has emerged in the two speakers, has not really the focus of advi advisor, advisorship and technical advice has not really kept pace with the need of the country, especially in countries like ours. So, sir, is there a need now? to think in terms of MDBs, either their, the scope is widened, the regional offices are strengthened, or we need MDBs, which have the expertise of the local area, and then serve local purpose, and are able to meet the local aspirations. So, uh, 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 Dr. Chaturvedi has talked about two things, which I should also highlight, and I'll say something and give it back to him. Uh, one, of course, is the infrastructure, you know, the, the gap between needs and resources, which maybe he can elaborate on. I'll come back to him in terms of long term loans. That really was a very important consideration in the 2010 reforms, uh, which really didn't happen very well at that time, uh, which uh, Dr. Bhalla has mentioned. Uh, uh, but, but we did get some forward movement, but very little. Uh, and, and the second one, your knowledge base actually is very interesting. Uh, this argument for converting World Bank and IMF into a knowledge bank actually is a way of evading the capital responsibility because they are unable to expand the capital base and lend more. They said, okay, we will just become an advisory. We don't need capital. So it's a two-edged sword, but you're right in the sense that the knowledge base they are creating is they are using the same knowledge from the developed countries and not enough from us. Uh, uh, you know, so again, perhaps somebody else can elaborate, but I just want to give uh, one uh, one story, one, one thing which we actually did win a little bit, and that was during my time at the IMF, uh, we had this argument about bringing uh, capital account convertibility, uh, and and this whole their, their uh, emphasis on macro conditions. Uh, and we argued very strongly and uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the sudden stops and, and, and so on were a separate thing. Even if you had a macroeconomic stability, you could get into a problem. So uh, capital controls had a role in certain conditions and uh, the developed countries argued against that. But we did have, you know, we, I, I, when I was there, we organized Brazil and other countries uh, and including at that time, China backed us. Uh, and managed to get a compromise on this issue. So, uh, but you're right, it is very episodic. I don't think uh, it's very deeply embedded. There's no uh, good mechanism of getting our views and our analysis into the system. But perhaps um, 
on both these points, uh, perhaps uh, first Dr. Chaturvedi and if Dr. Bhalla, I don't know if he's going wants to add something. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Virmani. You have uh, explained it very well. Uh, I would just like to remind uh, uh, the provision that in uh, uh, 2021 budget, uh, Honorable Finance Minister had announced setting up of uh, the Development Financial uh, Institution DFI uh, with targeted uh, uh, provision of uh, five lakh crores, and for which uh, she had announced 20,000 crores uh, 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 right in 2021 budget. So I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, probably is reflecting what uh, 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 Dr. Chiran Singh was saying uh, that we need to. Have have uh, 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 the regional aspirations addressed, and this is what uh, Dr. Virmani, I was suggesting that uh, uh, the the um, uh, uh, MPBs are not delivering what is required, and we are facing a challenge. Of course, in the domestic context, uh, uh, with IDBI and others going in the direction that they have gone. Uh, industrial finance, uh, uh, financing of infrastructure, largely a need that uh, developing countries uh, uh, face, and and uh, and you would see uh, Ocampo and many others at the international level, uh, John Kenneth and others, have been talking in terms of how do we raise uh, resources, how do we bring in uh, uh, the role uh, that uh, development banks are uh, are playing uh, in several economies, including in uh, uh, in uh, uh, countries like. Like uh, 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 Brazil, uh, uh, Stephanie Griffith Jones has also been talking in terms of how uh, uh, the development banks are are, are providing uh, uh, industrial finance, which was uh, uh, so well documented by Hajun Chang and others uh, uh, for uh, South Korea for uh, many other NICs. So I think uh, uh, Dr. Virmani uh, issue is at two tracks. One, uh, uh, the industrial finance uh, knowledge support. Uh, and, and second is uh, infrastructure financing gaps according to the local priorities, local requirements, and as uh, uh, Agenda 2030 says, localization of development. So this requires something, as Prime Minister is saying, uh, huge connectivity from uh, West Asia to uh, Central Asia to South Asia to Southeast Asia. When we talk about that, the INSTC and many other uh, uh, connectivity tools are getting adversely affected because uh, there is no one way coming up in terms of infrastructure financing. The mandates are, are, are broken. The challenges uh, with geopolitics are further complicating, and that's the reason why uh, BRI-related loans have created havoc all across. And this is where we need uh, 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 regionalization of finance and also uh, possible institutional frameworks to deliver. And this, I think, is something which is uh, uh, important in terms of uh, uh, the knowledge base, trying to see how that optimization may happen and in what way we can really go forward. The infrastructure financing that we are doing right now for India is also of great relevance uh, when it comes to, say, for uh, uh, power grid in South Asia. It is good for uh, not only India to uh, transfer power to Myanmar or to Bangladesh, but also for Nepal to use Indian uh, infrastructure to transfer uh, uh, power to, uh, to Bangladesh, which we are expecting Nepal to be surplus with uh, uh, by 2024, middle of 2024. So we need to see how uh, regional spin-offs are possible, regional gains are possible, and, and some of these may become uh, part of the larger uh, uh, infrastructure connectivity uh, narrative that we are uh, evolving uh, in India. The idea of... Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think the regional dimension is very important. I'll come back to you because I think our third speaker has joined and I also welcome uh, Mr. Berry, Suman Berry, the uh, Vice Chair of NITI. I'll come back to you, Suman, because we've been waiting for uh, uh, Franny uh, Dr. Franny to join us, so we will just hear her. Uh, please go ahead uh, with your talk. Uh, Dr. Franny. Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Arvind, and apologies for connecting late. I was having technical issues. Um, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you. And first of all, thank you very much for the work that the foundation is doing in popularizing important ideas in economics for development and helping push forward the implementation of these ideas because of the case examples that are shared. 
Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the work that we've been doing. I had the honor to chair the G20 panel that was tasked with reviewing the capital adequacy frameworks of the multilateral development banks. As you may know, the MDBs have a very important role right now, given what we're facing in the world. And the fact that if we didn't have the MPs, we would have to create them because so far they're the most efficient mechanism for drawing in private capital to be used at cheap rates for development purposes. And therefore having them function at the best possible manner is, is critically important. So our panel uh, was put together under the G20 presidency of Italy. And to show you how important the subject matter was, it was continued under the G20 presidency of Indonesia and now under the G20 presidency of India. So three countries have continuously pushed forward on this agenda. Our team got together, we had panel experts from all over the world with deep experience, some of them having worked for many years in the MDB, so understanding the MDBs from the inside out. Others who are academic researchers who've been researching MDBs for many years, but also people from the private sector who brought the market experience and the knowledge of how to work with credit rating agencies. So we put aside the traditional principles. We wanted to think from first principles in order to come up with new ideas of what could be done by the MDBs with the capital that they have right now and the tools and capabilities that they have. And our recommendations are summarized in the report, but I'll just highlight quickly the five key areas and why we thought those were important issues to look at. And in thinking about that, we had very much in mind the needs of the middle income countries who in the surveys that we had uh, told us about the role that they anticipate from the multilateral development banks. But we also had in mind the needs of the least developed countries because the development agenda remains important and critical even as we address climate risks and other risks. And then finally, we had the shareholders in mind because of the war in Ukraine, the current pressure in the energy prices and so on, the shareholders are also hurting for the most part. And therefore any ability to quickly come up with solutions that require large amounts of funding becomes challenging for most of the shareholders. And then we had, of course, the constituency of stakeholders, including the credit rating agencies, who are the watchdogs of how the MDBs perform. And we were mindful of what they look at and what kind of factors may influence the way in which they decide. So the first block of recommendations was targeted at the shareholders themselves, because we learned that the, the conservativeness of the MDBs is actually driven by the shareholders very tight requirements around the def definition of risk. And therefore, our first recommendation is targeted towards the shareholders for them to rethink risk appetite in the context of what is being asked of the MDBs today and what the world requires of the MDBs. The second block of recommendations was on one of the unique features of the MDBs, which is callable capital, which is a sort of a contingent collective insurance that the shareholders put together and this was done when the MDBs were created, which was just after the Second World War. Most of the countries were quite poor at that time and therefore didn't have deep pockets to invest in reconstruction and development. And the, this tool of callable capital was invented at that time to be used to crowd in private investments to invest in development. And to, to have that callable capital come in only when the MDBs get into distress. So as of today, with over 60 years of implementation, not a single time has callable capital been called. And we found that the uh, credit rating agencies are not giving the full credit to the MDBs of the meaning of callable capital. And therefore we ran some studies and had some estimates of what that could potentially look like if it was properly accounted for. The third block of recommendations was around innovative finance ideas basically arguing and looking through case studies and examples where this has been done, that the MDBs actually could do a lot more if they leverage what they uniquely have by working with the private sector and private capital. 
Uh, the first uh, important area was hybrid capital, where we had examples, uh, and even as we speak, the African Development Bank has published uh, the, the structure that they are going through for hybrid capital, which has been approved by their board. So we are quite happy that our recommendations are already under implementation, and some of them are going to be scaled up as well. The second, we looked at um, the role of insurance uh, to ensure at the portfolio level rather than transaction level, which is something that had been done for many years. And we also thought of a special role for MIGA because MIGA at the, at the moment is only supporting the World Bank. And we thought that MIGA could actually do much more uh, in looking at the other development banks and, and uh, devising instruments that could support them. Uh, we looked at uh, the role of guarantees, the role of portfolio transfers uh, to the private sector, particularly around ESG type portfolios where the MDBs are very good at bringing in and preparing projects that have ESG components, but then the private sector is much better at managing those portfolios. So thinking through ways in which securitization and other methodologies could be used. There are many other recommendations under the innovation block, but in the interest of time, I will not through all of them. The fourth category of recommendations was targeted towards the credit rating agencies. We looked particularly at the preferred creditor terms that the MDBs enjoy, and we found that uh, if you compare the MDBs country by country, instrument by instrument to commercial banks, they are 14 times less risky than commercial banks. But that 14 time value is not completely catered for by the credit rating agencies. Uh, and uh, we, we noted this because of the, the enjoyment that the MDBs have of the preferred creditor terms. The, the credit rating agencies have been quite responsive to those recommendations and have been able to, some of them, uh, address how they would look at changing the way in which they assess MDBs. And we are quite happy with where things are in terms of the response from the credit rating agencies. The last block of recommendations was on data, transparency, and governance around data, because we found that the MDBs could do a lot more if they collaborated with each other, if they made some of the information, not necessarily the data, but the information and statistics available to, to the public so that the credit rating agencies could use them and the market could also use them to better understand uh, the risk profile of the MDBs. And finally, uh, we also felt that the MDBs could actually share ideas of how they are innovating so that every MDB doesn't have to start from zero when they are going through an innovation process and that would speed up the, the time to market for their innovations and also reduce the collective cost of developing those ideas. I'll stop here in the interest of time and thank you very much for accommodating my late entry into this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very uh, succinct uh, uh, talk. Uh, uh, let me see if uh, Mr. Suman Berry wants to comment or ask any questions. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I can be seen, but, uh, uh, but terrific that um, EGRO, as part of the T20, has organized uh, this uh, discussion. I've been, I'm sorry that I missed your uh, framing of the of the four sessions as uh, questions. So um, let me just react to the parts of the discussion that I have uh, uh, heard, and I'm very pleased uh, for my selfish reason that Franny Lotier joined late, so I was able to hear her entire uh, her entire presentation, and I have indeed uh, been tracking the so-called CAF report uh, quite closely at the urging of friends like Amar Bhattacharya, Hobi Karas, and, uh, and Nick Stern. Um, so um, I think I'm going to start with, um, you know, what is it that the emerging markets want of the MDBs? Uh, I just list the issues in sequence and then elaborate on them. The second is that while it might actually be uh, uh, in a, while the World Bank may well be uh, the uh, the uh, the leader of the pack, the question of whether the various constraints, governance constraints on the World Bank, make it 
the right uh, flagship or whether, as was indicated by the, uh, by the reference just now to the African Development Bank uh, and was also referred to by Jeff Sachs at an event that RIS organized, whether uh, um, India in and of its, of its own right, uh, irrespective of being uh, the, uh, the uh, chair of the G20, whether it should be looking for innovations elsewhere in the MDB um, uh, universe. Um, and my third point, because I don't, I want to hear the rest of the discussion, is this issue of the preferred predator status. Because uh, from my reading of the CAF report, uh, the sense is that it is this that would uh, provide comfort to the rating agencies. My own view on this, and we are seeing this tested a little bit, in the uh, points that uh, the Chinese are making on um, on debt haircuts, that uh, the preferred creditor status of both the fund and the bank, but here we're talking of MDBs, uh, presumably has a limit. And my question for Franny would be, in uh, her deliberations with both the um, shareholders um, and with the rating agencies, uh, how far? can you push the preferred creditor status? But let me start with, uh, as it were, the tensions in the relevant paragraph of the uh, finance ministers and commercial bank governors communique that came out of Bangalore, uh, where they, uh, in one, or one sentence or a couple of sentences, uh, tried to combine public goods, triple A, the bank's uh, traditional development model, i.e. country by country, um, indicating that there's still work to do. My own sense to be tested by uh, uh, against the panelists is that, frankly, uh, the G7, and Sujit said that his view was it was still the G7 that largely ran the Bretton Woods institutions, at least, AIIB, is obviously a different kettle of fish, uh, but they uh, have relatively little um, interest in, as it were, project finance uh, for the uh, emerging markets. And indeed, it's not so long ago that graduation of the richer emerging markets was on, on the agenda. So my sense is that the G7 basically, uh, and the writings of somebody like Larry Summers for the group of 30, who is now uh, a co-chair of the expert group, basically was very clear that uh, these institutions need to be repurposed as institutions for global public goods. And so the question for India's G20 chair and India as, a, uh, uh, as a, uh, an important borrower, perhaps the largest borrower from the World Bank, is where do we stand on this? And on the related issue of uh, uh, how much can we flirt with the risk uh, to the AAA uh, rating? Uh, I'm personally not completely clear. I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, Sachin has been following this debate more clearly. Uh, exactly how global public goods are to be financed uh, within the present World Bank uh, model. Uh, is it going to be uh, by uh, having a third objective uh, of uh, climate change, which is one of the uh, one of the proposals in the evolution, uh, is said to be one of the proposals in the evolution report, or is this going to be by uh, by uh, uh, through, as it were, conventional country lending. But uh, I, I leave the most important for last. I think the point that Franny has made is that the MDBs are our best hope for reducing the cost of capital for emerging market and investment at a time when investment requirements are uh, sure to go up. And so thinking of these institutions, first of all, as financial intermediaries, and sorting out uh, uh, how we return to the brilliance of the original um, uh, mutual support model 
I think that is the key issue on the agenda. I've spoken much longer than I should have, thanks for your indulgence, and I look forward to your response and that of the panelists. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Franny, would you like to uh, respond to any of those issues? That... Yes, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Arvin, and thank you, Suman, for those comments. I'll respond maybe to three of the things that you raised. Uh, the first one is on the preferred creditor terms and what we found as we were doing our work. Uh, first of all, we found that it's a term that is very poorly understood in terms of its implication and importance in the dis distinction of, of the MDBs from other financial institutions that invest in the, de in the development objectives of uh, the countries that, uh, that are members of those banks. Um, and that is mostly because when you look at the statistics, with very few exceptions, there has not been a default by a country to one of the MDBs. Because when a country defaults, there is a, first there is a club effect where the MDBs have agreed that a default to one is a default to all. So countries actually don't usually have the opportunity to go shopping around, and therefore they have to first honor the obligations of the MDBs before they can access um, deeper funding because private markets keep an eye on whether a country is in good standing with the MDBs or not before pricing the risk that they would take in that country. So it has a direct implication then on the countries and therefore they pretty much stay within that framework and they pay back the loans. So, so that means default rates are very, very low and when they exist, they're mostly for the non-sovereign part of, of borrowing. The second thing we learned, however, it's a very fragile concept in the sense that it is a benefit that is endowed onto the MDBs by the countries. So the countries are the ones that really own the PCT. They are the ones who, who give it to the MDBs to leverage in this way. And therefore any weakening of that relationship has a direct implication in risk and therefore the cost of capital for development. And I think this is why we were very careful in our reports to protect the PCT and to show how valuable it is so that it, it becomes something that countries can continue to endow the MDBs and of course ask the MDBs then to deliver on the objectives as shareholders, uh, but to maintain that relationship. The second thing uh, that I wanted to mention is on the balance between the development objective, the climate risks, and then the uh, sort of pu global public goods. Um, I just came back from the One Forest Summit in Libreville, where it was highly obvious based on the comments that were made by the people who were invited from the indigenous communities who are largely responsible for managing these global public goods like forests and unique ecosystems, that the link between development nature and climate is very intertwined when it comes to developing countries. Because by, by when you look at the risk profile, it hurts mostly developing countries. Look at the flooding and the effect it has on India and Pakistan or Mozambique uh, and, and other countries. So they're hugely impacted by the risk side of climate. And therefore the development objective and the climate objective are completely interlinked. Likewise, on the nature side, uh, where by, by protecting and preserving nature, there is a, a stream of value that can be generated. And therefore the key remaining aspect is to work on the gaps as to why the countries that own those assets are not able to set the price for those assets, uh, because that's the way in which they could really drive the interlink in more effective ways, like the carbon price as an example. So in our report, we're careful to not pick and choose between sectors or between priorities, but to really focus on how MDBs can be leveraged to attract a lot more capital and to become more effective and efficient in deploying that capital so that it could stretch to meet not only the development objectives, but also the emerging climate and, and global public good objectives. And then, of course, we did not, uh, it was out of our terms of reference to talk about the capital increase, so we did not touch that subject, but we did not see it in competition with uh, what we were arguing on the capital adequacy side. However, we did argue that if the MDBs can do well what we are recommending, it makes the case even more strongly why they should be given more capital because they'll be able to show that they're managing capital more effectively for bigger impact. 
And then the last comment uh, is more around how do we then um, manage the, the interfaces between where the dialogue is today on these questions and the future where the capital will be needed even more. And, and, a, and a forum such as the one we are having today is absolutely critical so that the ideas and the, and the opportunities to reform can be embedded in those roadmaps that the MDBs are creating. Thank you very much. I'll stop here in the interest of time. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if uh, Professor Chaturvedi is still there. Um, okay. Professor Chaturvedi left. Okay. So, uh, can, we can open... Sharon, we, can we open the floor for... Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, Dr. Ashok Vishnu... Dr. Ashok, would you like to make some comments? Dr. Goel? Uh, hello. Yeah. Can I uh, can I uh, just make a few comments? Ashima. Yes, please. Yeah. So it's really nice. Egro is doing this. It's all very useful for the TF five uh, to to you know go over some of the older issues and the emerging issues. So you know one of the factors that uh, is really uh, puzzling. Uh, uh, me is that uh, when you talk to climate finance, the estimates that come up something like 4 trillion required compared to even if there is more MDB finance, it'll come to less than 1 trillion. So, uh, obviously, you need to look at wider solutions, not just the MDBs. MDBs are a very important part of it. So, if you think of, um, it, you know, philanthropic lending or public private partnerships or the use of warranties and coordination with the, the point um, about coordination with regional and national development banks uh, to make more information available because very often the cost of lending is high because of uh, lack of information and you know in india for example we have the digital track in the t20 where you talk about APIs that allow large databases to talk to each other and standardization. So if some of these initiatives can be used to, you know, design warranties and collaborations across banks, that really reduces the cost of capital and increases the amount by bringing in private finance as well as philanthropic finance. So what is your view on that? Dr. Fanny? Thank you very much, uh, Ashna, for that question. Um, I think uh, I'll start with the last point that you made. Uh, the most flexible form of capital that we have right now is philanthropic capital, uh, because many of the philanthropies that have been created are created in a structure that allows the philanthropists to pick and choose how they invest or finance, whether it's pure grants, returnable grants, or maybe grants with a small expected uh, return to meet the costs of managing those uh, philanthropic uh, managing philanthropic capital. So we find that there's a lot of innovation that can be driven through best ways of bundling philanthropic capital with other sources of finance. A good example is the polio eradication in Pakistan. I'm mentioning it here because it was the Gates Foundation working with Islamic Development Bank that came up with a way to pay down the cost of capital uh, that would then leverage even more resources for polio eradication than what either Pakistan could afford to borrow or what uh, the, the Islamic Development Bank itself had as a country exposure limit based on their risk profile, risk definition profile. So philanthropic capital can play that role. Uh, the second uh, aspect of your question is the role of national development banks. Uh, we found that these are absolutely critical, and even when you look at the sub-regional development banks, they are very innovative, they can move a lot faster, they are better aligned to the national priorities because they are owned, in, in the case of national development banks, by the countries, and therefore make a much nicer bridge between the country priorities and the, the opportunities to work with the MDBs. So all the innovations that we cite have some examples where it was a pairing between an MDB and a national development bank or a sub-regional development bank that innovated in a particularly uh, helpful way. And the, the national banks and the regionals or sub-regional banks 
can actually innovate at a lower cost and therefore they're a very good opportunity to test new ideas that can then be picked up and scaled up by the MDBs. And then finally, and I agree with you totally uh, uh, in the role of the private sector and private finance. And therefore, when you look at our recommendations, really almost all of them, but particularly this third subgroup of, of recommendations are targeted towards how MDBs can, can be leveraged to crowd in more private capital and particularly how that can be relevant for middle income countries, because the low income country problem, I think, to a large extent, we have solutions. Maybe we need more resources, but we roughly know how to get those resources. The challenge is for the middle income countries and how to best uh, reduce the cost of capital for things like global public goods for the climate risk that are becoming more, more uh, challenging. I hope I've addressed all your questions, but I wanted to do them in reverse order uh, to the one that you offered. Thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah. Okay, uh, Karen, do you, do you see any question in the chat box? We should get a few from the audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, Dr. Vishandas has a question, sir. But, uh, but sir, uh, in continuation of my earlier observation and then your example of capital account, I wanted to make an observation and seek opinion. But let let Dr. Ashok Vishandas go first. Okay, Dr. Vishandas, and, and Dr. Vishandas, can't hear you. Yes. Ah, thank you, yes. sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, chair. Thank you, Charan, and and the panelists. My one question to Freni. Uh, it was a masterful exposition. We got very richer by your your intervention. I just want to know one thing. You said if we compare the MDBs instrument by instrument with commercial banks. It is 14 times less risky. Now, given uh, two things on this, uh, what is the methodology? Is the methodology in the public domain? Or if you can briefly explain, I will be interested. Second is, if no country has ever defaulted in, in repayment, then it should be infinitely less risky. Because if you compare to the commercial banks, how it can be 14 times? Because it's, it's, uh, one thing. Secondly, uh, Dr. Bhalla, I'm sure he's he's on the uh, still on. Uh, he also said after 2010, uh, there has not been no reforms on the on the percentage of the quota across the country. Now, uh, given a lot of water is flowing in the Indian Ocean, uh, how can we sustain this kind of arrangement? Because most of the countries. Uh, in our concentrated G7 who call the shot. So do you see in, in foreseeable future any reforms in the in these MDBs? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ashok, for those questions. Uh, the, the study that I mentioned, unfortunately, we cannot release to the public. It's been released to the G20 shareholders and to each MDB because the MDBs didn't want the information to be distributed uh, publicly. However, it was a comparison of, of instruments like issue, issuance of bonds. So if you take a bond issued, issued at the same time in the same country by an MDB com compared to commercial issue, the risk rating is 14 times lower, right? So it's for a very specific instrument. And of course, as you said, for all the other areas like development finance, Clearly, the MDBs far outperform the other potentially investors in that space because they have all the tools available to get repaid. The only challenge is by when they get repaid, right? Because if a country goes into war or conflict, those repayment periods are stretched and therefore it has a liquidity impact on the MDBs, which has a cost, right? So it's not completely risk-free from that point of view. But clearly, it is much less risky than any other entity doing that kind of business from a commercial point of view. Uh, on your second question, uh, this is one of the reasons why our very first recommendation was on risk appetite. Because risk appetite is driven by country conditions, by global conditions, by sectoral choices, but also by the instrument choice. 
And therefore, as the MDBs look at their evolutionary roadmaps, they have to look at all of those factors combined. Where are the risks increasing? And is the capital allocation model appropriate for that new pattern of risks? Where is population growing? Uh, where is poverty increasing? Where are the climate risks much more pressing and so on? And, and how to best combine what the, the, the tools that the MDBs have with the availability of liquidity in the markets that could be brought to bear on those different solutions and therefore release capital for other opportunities where it's much harder to bring in the private sector. So all those are really residing within the definition of risk appetite, because once you have that done at the right level, then the capital implications become quite straightforward, including the portfolio concentration ratios, the country exposure ratios, and so on, which I think would address your question around the countries around the Indian Ocean. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, Charan? Sir, my comment was uh, as follows and related to the earlier observation. If we look at the uh, look at the uh, advisory role and along with the advisory, the financial support. So you mentioned about the capital control and I had in mind financial inclusion and also I had in mind the income inequalities. Now coming to financial inclusion for a long time, we were struggling with financial inclusion until we went in, dovetailed, did a national mission strategy and did the jam treaty. And that is where then we achieved to a very great extent financial inclusion. The point, sir, then is that the World Bank, which is a repository of the wisdom across the world, did not really come back to us and share that this is the way we could go about doing it. Also, the digital revolution through which we finally succeeded, I think, hasn't been sufficiently translated to the least developed countries in Africa. The fintech revolution that took place is also taking place in the country on its own. So, sir, my question is to Franny, when she did speak about the crowding out, the question is, are the resources at these MDBs being optimally utilized and targeted at issues that really need to be addressed in emerging and least developed countries? Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question, uh, Dr. Singh. I'll, um, I'll, I'll respond in two ways. First, through the work we did in my role as the chair of the G20 Capital Adequacy Framework, and then my own personal views as an African working in Africa now since 2009. Um, so in the capital adequacy framework report, our terms of reference did not uh, uh, include uh, making or opining on allocation across countries, across sectors and so on. So we did not really go into that issue in our report, but we did highlight areas where the MDBs could be faster uh, could be could work deeper and and have more impact by first of all learning from each other because some MDBs had already innovated in the areas that you mentioned uh, and 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 also within the MDBs themselves they are examples of where that has been done well but they have not been mainstreamed uh, systematically across so for example when I was working at the World Bank and uh, working on India. Uh, we, were, we were working with uh, people who were already at that stage using digital devices to collect information about farmers and to transfer funds directly to farmers, whether it's for irrigation needs, for preserving the crop, whether it's for bringing milk to the market and so on. So very small scale uh, solutions, but that were inclusive in terms of finance and that were development accretive. And, and those innovations were taking place and financed some of them by the World Bank because I was working at the World Bank at the time. Uh, but again, they were not completely scaled up across the whole country using World Bank resources. So that's a question you could say could, be, could have been done better. What we tried to do again when I was at the World Bank, we, we collected 100 case studies of how countries had borrowed and used bank resources to get deep and systemic poverty reduction. 
And those case studies were widely diffused and we used, for example, the conditional cash transfers, which is a solution that had worked very well in Brazil. We're able to have it implemented in Turkey, in Uganda, and during COVID, it was one of the most effective solutions to transfer cash directly to the hands of households that were much in need of those cash transfer resources. So that was a 20 year old innovation, but it became extremely valuable during the, uh, the COVID period. Likewise, the early investments that were done when President Wolfensohn was there investing in the digital technologies that drove the IT revolution in Africa and other parts of the world, where we were some of the early adopters at the World Bank in those days for using video conferencing to have meetings. The World Bank decentralized, got people in over 100 countries and connected them to Washington using video conferencing. Those solutions have become so important now for digital health, digital education, and even for conducting business during the COVID uh, pandemic where people were not able to go uh, travel or, or, or move around. So I think there is there is an uptake of those innovations, but it is slow. And our recommendation group five, where we argue that data, transparency, information sharing, and having a space where MDBs talk to each other and share examples would actually speed up and scale up those solutions, including the ones that you mentioned on financial inclusion. Now, from my own work uh, where I am right now uh, and observing where Africa is on the fintech side, I think Africa has done one of the most amazing transformations using fintech solutions. We have uh, companies like Mpesa in, that started in Kenya that are now all over East Africa that are really driving the way banking is being done. In fact, banking reform right now in Africa is driven by fintech because the digital economy has really put a huge uh, pressure on banks to transform. Uh, you see the same thing now on prepaid services for electricity, and that's how renewable energy, for example, is growing with companies like Mkopa, where you get a renewable energy solution and you get a prepaid solution and you use digital platforms to pay your electricity uh, and so on. Uh, likewise, for um, solutions in terms of where do you target public spending by knowing where pockets of poverty, pockets of poverty are. And here you have companies like uh, Frame and others who are looking across uh, big countries like Nigeria and identifying through satellite imagery the pattern of electricity use and so on, which gives you an indicator of development uh, uh, gaps. And therefore, it's easier than to channel city and regional resources to target those areas. So I think the digital revolution in Africa has been quite tremendous and is still continuing to deliver value. I Thank hope I've answered your questions. Thank right. you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I remember uh, that reminds me, uh, I, my first uh, foray or rather my incentive was learning about Mpesa from Kenya and the South African delivery of pensions to villages uh, through the mobile phones. So yes, I, I think a lot of people in India and many other places don't know uh, that Africa actually was one of the, the pioneers or, or the pioneering innovations happened in Africa. And that after learning these two things, I became a, a big advocate of uh, um, mobile uh, banking, et cetera, in India. And it actually it took uh, several years because our regulators were very, uh, very cautious, highly risk averse, so they wouldn't allow it on the phones. But we did eventually get there, and then of course we moved very fast and, and did many more innovations. Yeah, but but uh, that's quite correct uh, reminder that Africa actually started uh, sometime before us, maybe three to five years, but but still uh, way ahead. Okay, so uh, uh, perhaps we have a. Actually, we are almost at the end of our time. Uh, Charan, do you want to? Uh, I don't see anything else in the chat box. And uh, if that's it, uh, unless somebody yes. has a comment, I will just end it here. Uh, Absolutely, sir. I think we have had a very good session and very informative, especially Dr. Franny joining late, but uh, guiding us and very informative talk. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, I would just thank the participants. I guess two of them have gone. So thank you all uh, and the listeners.
And with that, let me hand it over to you to conclude it. Conclude the yeah. session. Yeah, I must thank all of you for being with us today and participating and enriching the discussion that we have had. We have had three speakers. Uh, Dr. Sujit Bhala has himself worked, worked in the World Bank and then was executive director at the IMF and he started presenting. He, he was the first speaker, followed by Professor Sachin Satvedi. And now, of course, we had Dr. Fanny. We have had a good discussion and I want to thank each of the speakers. I also want to thank our chair, Dr. Arvind Birmani, who himself has been in the World Bank. Uh, I forgot to tell you in the introduction, he started his career there after his doctorate at the World Bank. And I think 86, 87, he was uh, up there before he came to India and then played a critical role and a very important role in the reforms that took place in 1991. So I must thank him for being here with us, chairing the session and leading the discussion. I also want to thank the participants. Our Recording for today's discussion will be available by noon tomorrow. Our next discussion is on next Friday. And again, uh, it's on a very important topic. Again, under the G20, we are going to be covering regulations and prudential norms, Basel norms. Should they be universal or should they be regional? That is the type of topic that we are going to be covering next Friday. Would invite all of you to please come and participate, share your thoughts. Two weeks after that, that is 24th and 31st, we are going to be covering climate finance. And Dr. Fanny, you had a couple of observations today, and uh, our colleague here, Professor Ashima Goel, also mentioned that we are dedicating two weeks to climate finance, and that will be March 24 and March 31. On April 7, we are going to be discussing about monetary policy. And we are going to be discussing about inflation targeting. Professor Jeffrey Frankel from Kennedy School will be joining us for that. So on till uh, middle of May, we'll be sharing these thoughts with the best minds across the world on topic of Task Force 5. We would invite you all to be with us uh, and participate and enrich the discussions. Once again, thanks again for today. Hope to look forward meeting you next Friday. Thank you.